Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for CashIntoCoins.com. So you want to buy some Bitcoins? CashIntoCoins.com makes it fast, easy, and safe to get Bitcoins. Just deposit the money into their account at any of the major banks they support, and then just email them a picture of the receipt in your Bitcoin address, and you get your Bitcoins. Almost always the same day it clears. In a tough, competitive new market, CashIntoCoins.com has the advantage. A great system and great customer service to keep you coming back. That's CashIntoCoins.com. Just click the link in the right margin at ScottHorton.org. All right, y'all, welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show, scotthorton.org, libertyexpressradio.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, slash Scott Horton Show, and et cetera like that. Hey, you got a search engine, man. You can find it. All right, next up, I mean, first up, I mean, our guest today is Eric Margulies, author of War at the Top of the World and American Raj, Liberation or Domination. His website is ericmargulies.com. Uh, spelt like Margolis, and he also writes for LouRockwell.com and for Unz.com. That's U-N-Z, Unz.com. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Eric? Oh, I'm fine. I'm watching all this fast-breaking news with uh, fascination and trepidation. All right. Well, if I remember right, it was last Friday was our last uh, interview, and it started with, oh, good, they've worked out some kind of interim deal, and they're going to have some elections and, uh, yeah, no, I think as soon as the interview was over, the coup d'etat was on. Why don't you catch us up? Uh, yes, the uh, what looked like a possible settlement negotiated by the EU to Ukraine's ongoing uh, crisis uh, fell apart immediately uh, as uh, militant demonstrators uh, uh, rejected it, uh, I'm talking in, uh, in Kiev, uh, and the... Uh, then the Ukrainian president, or uh, maybe he still is, was ousted and fled for his life from Kiev. Uh, a new parliament was uh, elected with a new uh, speaker, uh, all part of the militant nationalist Ukrainian movements. Uh, and uh, the rest of Ukraine, and, uh, the, the Russian-speaking party of Ukraine, said, no way, we're not going to go along with it. And trouble's broken out there now. It's a very dangerous situation. Now, uh, I guess one obvious question that jumps out at me is whether, you know, the the so-called coalition, whoever they are, the, the American bankroll types who are taking over the government now, whether they will have the strength to actually exercise monopoly control over the East or whether they're just going to end up having a sort of de facto autonomy anyway. How powerful is their national police force? How powerful is their army? And can they enforce monopoly state rule over the East? Or have they done this too many times and now they're just going to sort of kind of de facto break up anyway? Well, we just don't know at this point. Uh, the army so far has stayed out of the political turmoil. Its commander uh, just said a day or two ago that it would not uh, intervene in the fighting and it wouldn't Definitely not, but it would oppose Russian troops if they entered into Ukraine. Uh, but we don't know what the rank and file in the army has to say, because it probably mirrors the same uh, ethnic and cultural political splits uh, that the rest of the country does. And meanwhile, while this is going on, uh, Russia has just mobilized 150,000 troops in its western regions, within more or less striking distance of Ukraine. I think this was an inevitable development. Uh, Yanukovych, the deposed president, has showed up in Russia, in Rostov-on-Don, claiming that uh, he was a hard done by and he's still the president. Uh, Putin, who's playing a very cagey game, uh, had nothing to say on the subject and hasn't even met with him. Uh, he's wildly reviled as a coward and incompetent. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, gangs, uh, heavily armed gangs in Crimea are uh, seizing government buildings and their reports that they and or some Russian troops have taken positions around Crimea's two main airports. Uh, there's a very strong pro-Russian move in Crimea, which is uh, almost 80% ethnic Russian and was only given to Ukraine, which was then a Soviet Socialist Republic in 1954, by Nikita Khrushchev, reportedly when he was drunk. And uh, so um, 
there's no reason for Crimea to be in Ukraine. It's a very strategic location with its great port at Sevastopol. And uh, there the tensions stay. It's, it's, it's very frightening because what I've been warning about for months and months is that these events are putting the, uh, the Western powers in Russia on a collision course. All right. Now, I'm trying to put myself in Putin's shoes, but I'm not very good at that because I don't know much about being the autocrat of Russia or anything like that. But uh, I did see uh, this guy. I don't know his name. I don't know if he has one, but they said he was, I believe they said he was the editor of Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. And so not the neocon wackos, but more of the centrist establishment. Although there are some neocon kooks live there like uh, Abrams and Boot and I guess Crystal sometime. But anyway, this guy didn't seem like much of a neocon. He was just, you know, a plain old vanilla State Department type or something. And he was saying, uh, I think to Jon Stewart that, Oh, he, 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 yeah, while Putin's looking the other way at the Olympics, we're running off with Ukraine, and aren't we clever, and this kind of thing. And I was thinking that if I was Putin, I might not even waste more than half of a chuckle at that, and then I might wait these guys out for three or four weeks until their plan falls apart, because what possible influence can America really maintain in Ukraine when it is, in fact, Russia's backyard? Well, we can we could have a military influence if we want to face a war with Russia, which would be beyond idiotic, since uh, we're both nuclear armed powers. Uh, I wrote last year already that if things aren't diplomatically resolved in Ukraine, we could be facing another Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, I'm not ready to die for Kiev or Dnepropetrovsk. Uh, and most Americans, 90% of Americans couldn't find Ukraine on a map if their lives depended on it. But that's the case. But the other end of is money. Uh, Ukraine is 44 million people. It's completely bankrupt. Uh, it's literally down to its last few dollars of reserves. Putin offered $15 billion to bail them out alone, mm-hmm. uh, which is not enough, but uh, Europe wouldn't even match that offer, it seems. Now it's a ping-pong game of who can bail out Ukraine better, but in my view, the, F- the Ukrainian finance minister just said, of the new government, just said that Ukraine uh, would need a minimum of $35 billion uh, just to keep its head above water, and who in his right mind would lend money to a country like this that doesn't really have an established government, that's a chaos, nobody knows who's in charge, and it's filled with, you know, angry, uh, disgruntled people. So uh, you're facing, you're having both a political crisis and a financial crisis at the same time. Right, well, I mean, isn't the easy answer the American taxpayer who, and they're not in their right mind, but... All they got to do is really all Obama has to do is go ask Janet Yellen for the checkbook and go over Pretty there and money. pay off whoever he needs to, and it'll cost us in the unemployment line later. But yeah, you know the good, the the only bright side of this crisis is that Ukraine in 1991 had nuclear weapons as part of the Soviet military, and Ukraine got rid of them. They sold them for money to the Americans. Uh, it's a good thing they don't have them today, otherwise we'd really be worried. Yeah, did you see where Josh Rogan had that thing in the Daily Beast about these Republicans openly saying, we wish the Cold War was here, because then, uh, you know, everybody knew where everybody stood and all this, and they didn't really realize that these idiots, that their real argument is, if the Soviets completely and totally dominated all of Eastern Europe, that would be effective at keeping us from meddling where we don't belong. But since... The Soviets aren't here to stop us. Here we are screwing up everything. That's their complaint. uh, You know, I've often said that the fall of the Soviet Union unbalanced the uh, world political order, and uh, Putin said the same thing. I'm not saying that the Soviet Union was a good thing. It was an evil empire in many ways, but uh, as Reagan called it. But uh, it certainly uh, left the United States with unlimited power, and we know that unlimited power, absolute power, corrupts absolutely. We violated our agreements with Mikhail Gorbachev not to expand NATO. We're right on Russia's doorstep now. We're trying to take away its 
historical heartland, Ukraine. And uh, I'm I'm really concerned. I mean, Ukraine means an enormous amount to Russia. Uh, it's like a foreign power trying to take Texas away from the United States. Uh, the Russians are going to dig in their heels. So far, the Russian response has been very measured and reserved, but uh, emotions are at play here. Well, so, I mean, I guess there is no status quo, really. It's a fluid situation, but would you bet on the likelihood of Russian military intervention? Oh, I'd give it a 50% probability. Jesus. Oh, um, <laughs> and uh, the U.S. would then be confronted by an awful decision. What's it going to do? Okay, big talker. Uh, I wrote a couple of weeks ago, the president, our president, said, you know, warn the Russians, keep your hands off Ukraine or there will be consequences. Well, okay, big talker, here they are. What are the consequences? Right. Uh, you know, you're going to go Democrats to war. These sure are tough guys, aren't they? Uh, yeah. So um, it's it's dangerous. There's a, there's a looming civil war in Ukraine between the eastern and western portions. You know, my own view, my Ukrainian friends will, will uh, skin me alive for saying this, but I really think Ukraine, the, probably the ultimate, the best solution to this is a peaceful division of Ukraine into western Ukrainian-speaking regions and the eastern, which are totally Russian areas, Russian-speaking, historically Russian, and which are completely wired into Russian industry. So, uh, and to divide the two and let the Russians have the east and let whoever the hell wants and can afford uh, western Ukraine to have it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things that's going on here too i saw and i don't know how representative this is although accusations sure fly a lot but i saw a picture of these uh ukrainian brown shirts beating up an old woman kicking her and she looked pretty damn old too and it says well she was on her way to deliver flowers to the lenin statue and so they were beating her ass and so i you really have not like in america where everybody just calls each other names you really have to some degree the commies versus the nazis on the ground there which means really hard feelings going back to world war ii who sided with hitler and who sided with stalin and so how are people like that you know when when those are at least you know a, a part of what defines them, if not what they're fighting about today, you know, in terms of policy, they're more fighting about who has the power is all. But uh, well, when, when it's, that's who who versus who. How are you going to have a democracy of compromise with a situation like that? Right. Right. Got to split them up. All right. Now, uh, hold it right there. It's the commercial break. We got to go out to it. And uh, we'll be right back with the great Eric Margulies, author of American Raj, right after this. Hey, Al Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Horenberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. You can retweet my brilliance at twitter.com slash Scott Horton Show if you want. You can also uh, check out Eric Margulies on Twitter, at Eric Margulies. Spell it like Margolis. <laughs> I got one commenter who hates it when I say that. Well, how else are you supposed to spell it? Like Margulies? That don't make any sense. Uh, welcome back. It's the show. Now, Eric, uh, all this talk about commies and Nazis, it's its really bad of me. It's dumb of me to go out to a break calling people commies and Nazis and then not uh, able to you know, have it explained what exactly we're talking about here. Can you fill me in? Especially, I, and I've seen the evidence of the Nazis on the street out there with their SS lightning bolts and their uh, you know, Hitler salutes and their iron crosses everywhere. I don't know. I guess I saw a couple of swastikas. Uh, and there are a couple of reports of somebody tried to firebomb a synagogue or, or a, a Jewish school or something like that. I don't really know. Uh, and I don't know too much about who all still loves Lenin and Stalin in Ukraine, but maybe they do. Can you fill us in on who these people are and why they hate each other so much? Yes, Scott. First thing, starting point is we've got to remember that Stalin in the 1930s uh, murdered 
between six and seven or eight million Ukrainians by shooting them or starving them to death. There was widespread cannibalism in the Ukraine. It was a, a campaign uh, designed by the Soviet Eichmann, whose name was Lazar Kaganovich, to uh, break the spirit of the independent farmers in in Ukraine. So Ukraine uh, suffered mass genocide, a holocaust, in fact, long before anybody ever heard of Adolf Hitler. Uh, We were allied to the same country in World War II that committed this monstrous crime. Today, unfortunately, everybody's using these these terms, uh, fascists, Nazis, commies like that, but there really aren't many communists left. Everybody's disillusioned with communism. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Russians and the Ukrainian, the pro-Soviet Ukrainians, are uh, calling everybody who opposes them a fascist, gangster, bandit, uh, black shirts and that kind of thing, brown shirts. Um, yeah, but it's not true. It is it is very much exaggerated. There are some uh, street thugs who you'll find in Kiev and other cities who use Nazi salutes and beat up people. Uh, you also find them in Moscow in great numbers, and you find them uh, in Europe as well. I mean, these are street hooligans. Uh, scum of the gutter, as my mother used to call them. Uh, but they don't dominate the, uh, the Ukrainian political process. Uh, these, most of its leaders are nationalists who want, who desperately want an independent state free from Russia. Uh, Real fascists, angry. guys with bank accounts. Well, that's different, but the, uh, the, the so-called fascists are not fascists and they hark back to the Ukrainian resistance movement against the Soviet rule in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, its leaders were murdered mostly by the Soviet secret police. Um, they, side, they, they sided for a while with, uh, with the, the Germans, in 1941 and 42, uh, as did many other European countries. So the same thing happened in Yugoslavia and Belgium and Holland. But uh, they, they were not doing it because they were Nazis, but because uh, they wanted to throw the Russians out. And at that time, the Germans looked like liberators. Yeah, well, and that's part of the story of World War II, of all the different uh, peoples, as they're collectively called, stuck between the Nazis and the communists during World War II is, you know, you do what you have to survive under the Nazis. Then when the Russians show up, you got to explain how come you're still alive, that you must have gotten along with the Nazis while they were here, and then vice versa again when it switches back again. Exactly. You know, a lot of innocent people died over stuff like that. We, the United States, collaborated with the biggest mass killers in history, which was the Soviet Union. Yeah, including even after the war with Operation Keel Hall. Yes. Man, you want to tell them about that since I brought it up and it's the most horrible thing any American president ever did that I can think of? Yeah, this is, you're referring to the British uh, handover of the Cossacks? Well, and, or yeah, Truman's. Uh, some of them were in the United sure. States, I believe, were drugged up and, and you know tied up and put on ships and sent back to Stalin after the war. The yes, uh, uh, the British were even worse with this. Uh, many of the groups who had been fighting the communists uh, notably the Cossacks, uh, Russian Cossacks, uh, uh, and uh, Muslim groups were who had fled to the British and the American lines for safety, uh, and French units fighting for the Germans were all handed, handed back, and they were all shot yeah. in, in great numbers. Yeah, Jacob Hornberger has a great, I think, uh, six or seven part series or something uh, all about Keel Hall and the I think he counts uh, two million people, something like that. Too many, uh, two million prisoners of war handed back to Stalin to be shot. Where, right? If you surrender, if you if you're in Stalin's army and you surrender, that's a capital offense. Whether you got a rifle in your hand or not, you're not allowed to surrender to the Germans, and because we're going to kill you anyway, kind of thing. So, so each and every one of them that were sent back, we're all guilty of the capital crime of surrender, basically. That's correct. Even Stalin's son was captured, and when. Stalin heard that. He said something like, well, I hope he dies. So uh, 
that was the policy. So we have much to be ashamed of, uh, but we're still uh, overcome by war propaganda. Uh, it's going to take years more for some more truth to emerge. Yeah. But so where you have some of these brown shirts uh, running around in the street with their baseball bats and all of that, you wouldn't put too much stock in their rise to power or anything. These are just... They're the the useful street toughs for the coup for now, and then they'll melt away, or what? I believe so. We see the same type of young men in uh, at the barricades in Spain uh, and in Italy and in Germany, and uh, you name it. Uh, there's just a a lumpen proletariat of violent people. We see them in Paris too, who are ready to ride. The French call them casseur. Breakers, they're ready to just go and smash things and throw Molotov cocktails. But uh, the upper echelons of the Ukrainian nationalist movement uh, are not street thugs and uh, are certainly more thoughtful. It would be wrong to dismiss them as fascists. All right, now, so the Russians already have this giant base, uh, naval base in uh, Crimea, and I guess their lease expires in 2043 or something like that. So that's not going anywhere. Um, uh, I don't know. What do you expect? you think Putin's just going to maybe park some more boats there and make it a little bit more difficult for the Americans to really think about trying to push their luck when it comes to special so. Crimea? Uh, I've been, uh, I've toured the whole uh, naval base at Sevastopol. It's quite fascinating. It's huge. It's beautiful. Beautiful natural harbor. And uh, it is contains most of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, uh, which is tasked with uh, tr transiting the Dardanelles and going into the Mediterranean. So this is their opening to the Mediterranean and Indian Ocean, for example. They have only one other major naval base on the on the Black Sea, and that's at Novorossiysk. Uh, so uh, this is vital. This is a vital Russian interest. Uh, the Russians have a lot of ships there. They have troops. It's almost it's an extraterritorial area, sort of like their Guantanamo. Uh, and uh, they've made clear that there's no way that they're going to to give up this base. And and I'm convinced that the Russians would fight to defend it. Well, that Barack Obama, he backs down on everything good he ever said he was going to do, except the Iran talk so far, I guess. Now, I mean, he backed down in 2009 and 2010 when he could have made it happen, so don't get me wrong. But uh, he seems to follow through on all his worst stuff most of the time, like surging into Afghanistan or, you know, that Keep kind of Guantanamo thing. Guantanamo is still open, but I guess, I don't know, I sort of have faith in his cowardice that he's not going to push his luck here and get himself and the rest of us killed messing with the Russians, right? Well, I hope so. That's that's the only good thing I could ever say about Bill Clinton, too. He didn't get us into a major war. Uh, but these Republicans in, uh, in in Congress are very warlike. They are thirsting for the Cold War, as you were saying earlier. And the thing is, you know, we've got our we've got our butts kicked in Afghanistan. We've lost that war. We just won't admit it. We got run out of Iraq. Uh, Al Qaeda, which we were supposed to crush like a gnat, is popping up all over. Uh, so. Uh, we've had one reverse or defeat after another. Uh, there are a lot of people who are itching. They want to see us go and have a get, bring the Soviets back. Uh, they were fun to fight, and uh, we're doing that to an extent with Russia. Putin, however, in Russia, KG Mr. Putin, former KGB agent, uh, is uh, too clever to uh, to fall for these uh, provocations, and is being very cautious. On what he's doing. Thank goodness, once again, we see that our fate is more in Putin's hands than it is in Obama's for the moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Very stupid question with only 30 seconds to answer it, but whatever happened to Prince Bandar, speaking of Al Qaeda? Well, Bandar's down there grumbling and gnashing his teeth uh, because the U.S. won't more bomb Syria. Uh, I mean, they're saying he's missing or something. He didn't show up at the big summit in D.C. Or I forgot. Well, there's a power struggle going on in Saudi Arabia, and uh, and he's the intelligence chief too. So it's more likely he's hold hold up there chewing beetle nuts and plotting. <laughs> 
All right, everybody. That's the great Eric Margulies. Thanks very much again for your time, Eric. Cheers, Scott. All right, everybody. That's Eric Margulies. EricMargulies.com, spelled like Margolis. LouRockwell.com, Uns.com, U-N-Z, Uns.com. We'll be right back. Man, you need some new stickers for the back of your truck. Scott Horton here for LibertyStickers.com. Aren't you sick and tired of everyone else being wrong about everything all the time? Well, now you can tell them all what's right with some stickers from LibertyStickers.com. At LibertyStickers.com, they're against everything, so you know they're good on your issue, too. Whether it's the wars, police, state, gun laws, the left and right of the president, LibertyStickers.com has hundreds of choices so you can find just the right words to express your opposition and contempt for those who would violate your rights. That's LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, all Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first. And just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way, the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. On March 7th at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., the Council for the National Interest is co-hosting the first ever National Summit to reassess the U.S.-Israel special relationship. Confirmed speakers include Walt Scheuer, Giraldi, McGovern, Katowski, Porter, McConnell, Weiss, Romando, USS Liberty survivor Ernie Gallo, as well as co-sponsors Alison Ware of If Americans New and the great Grant Smith of the Institute for Research, Middle East Policy. That's the National Summit to reassess the U.S.-Israel special relationship. Friday, March the 7th, all day at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., natsummit.org. Today's show is brought to you in part by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download at audibletrial.com slash scott. Audible has over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. For Scott Horton Show listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with their free 30-day trial. I personally recommend Dirty Wars by Jeremy Scahill. It's great for anyone wanting the inside story on the cruel and counterproductive terror war of the Obama years. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and download Dirty Wars at no charge by going to audibletrial.com slash scott. That's audibletrial.com slash Scott.